I think most introduction would be superfluous to anyone who's a libertarian. His achievements are immeasurable. His topic for today will be strategies for achieving liberty. Dr. Rothbard. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, now that we're all agreed, of course, as, as manifest by yesterday's debate, we're all agreed on the objectives we want to achieve. The next question to talk about <clears throat> is uh, how do we go about uh, arriving at them? Uh, in other words, strategy. Uh, one thing about the libertarian movement is that uh, there's been about a hundred times more discussion of theory than there has been of strategy, which I'm not, I'm not against, of course, discussing theory and how the appeals court would work in the, in the free market system and all that. But uh, also there's been a problem that there's a tremendous dearth and deficiency of <clears throat> strategic discussion. I think one of the reasons for this is that most uh, libertarians tend to have, I think, a very simplistic view of uh, strategy. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> simplistic view being what I call educationism. <clears throat> uh, I first want to preface this by saying I'm not opposed to education. Uh, having been an educator in one way or the other all my life, I'm, I'm obviously uh, should be clear that I'm not opposed to it. On the contrary, I think it's very important, uh, uh, exciting, terrific, and necessary. <clears throat> uh, and this includes uh, the sort, sort of thing we're doing today. It includes books, uh, uh, pamphlets, uh, propaganda, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All, all, the, all these things which are, can be encompassed in the term education. However, what I'm trying to say is that education is not enough. I mean, pure education is not enough. In other words, it's a necessary but not sufficient condition for achieving liberty. Uh, <clears throat> and it's, if we begin to realize that it's not enough, then we get into problems. So, I mean, strategy is a, is a difficult area. For one thing, strategy is not an apodictic area. It's not the sort of thing where you can say, A is A, uh, man, men exist, and that sort of thing, and deduce your entire uh, political and philosophic system. <clears throat> it's an area where... Uh, Conclusions are tentative. Uh, uh, they have to be, you know, it's more of a sort of a learning by doing process, and you're never sure, absolutely and positively sure that your strategy is going to work. So uh, <clears throat> it's an area where there's more, it's, it's obviously more chancy than, than the area of pure theory. Uh, however, it's an area, it seems to me, which has to be undertaken, chancy uh, or not. Uh, the. Uh, one of the reasons why, uh, well, I, I say, if, if we think, you see, if, if we, we believe that education is enough, uh, pure education, that's all we have to do, then we can have the sort of attitude which many of us have, of uh, which uh, in uh, general uh, political circles are, is called sectarianism. In other words, the attitude that, uh, well, if this guy is not absolutely correct on every single topic, uh, if he doesn't have the proper theory of perception or uh, free will or whatever, the hell with him. Uh, we don't talk to him. You know, we we we, we turn on on our heel and, and stamp off. Uh, this sort of attitude, <coughs> uh, the sectarian attitude, is fine, I suppose, if uh, if uh, all you're interested in is getting a, a, a group of uh, purists uh, together. Although even there, I think it's self-defeating because if you don't talk to the people who, who slightly deviate from your, your position, it's not very likely they're going to arrive at the full truth uh, because they won't be in a position to hear it. <laughs> but uh, aside from that, um, this this sort of attitude uh, again, you know, fosters uh, the view that uh, well, uh, you know, the hell with them. He's not he, this this person is not really pure enough, and uh, uh, no no reason to have anything to do with him. Uh, the, uh, but if we begin to realize that education is not enough, then we have a problem. And the problem is how to take our theory, which we're still refining and, and developing and so forth, take this theory and try to apply it to the real world. In other words, to try to mold the real world into a position closer to our, our ideal. How to get from here to there, the famous cliche. Uh, and one, well, one of the... Uh, one of the problems, just to, to illustrate this, I, I attended a small strategy conference uh, a few a few weeks ago, very small, about eight or nine people, and all of them were dedicated libertarians. I mean, this time we all did agree on the ends; there was no problem there. But uh, the general uh, position there was, well, let's see. We got first of all, we got to oppose violent revolution. That's that. Okay. And then we got to oppose um, 
any having anything to do with the mass demonstrations because they're really implicitly violent, so they're out. Uh, then we have to oppose uh, lobbying, have any, anything to do with politicians because they're evil. So uh, we can't lobby or have anything to do with them or vote or engage in political parties or anything of that sort. Uh, civil disobedience is, is morally okay, but it's sort of, you know, uncomfortable or whatever. I mean, it's not going to work very well. You're going to get you to jail, so that's out. And systematically, uh, and they, I, I try to point out as gently as I know how to the assembly, <laughs> that they thereby systematically closed off every conceivable area of uh, victory. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And I think that I think that's a real problem. The only I've also pointed out to them as gently as I know how that the only area, there's only one area they are not closed off, and this is the only area really which educationism per se can, allows for victory, and that is that Richard Nixon, uh, Nelson Rockefeller, Lyndon Johnson, etc., 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 they all read, <laughs> etc. Uh, they all read uh, they read our stuff, you know. I mean, they, somehow they get, they get a hold of human action or power and market or Atlas Shrugged or whatever, and they read it, and they say, by God, they're right, I quit. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this is really the, the, the uh, implicit uh, strategy of educationism. They read our stuff, they say, okay, we, uh, we quit, and that's it. The state disappears. Now, I am the first one to say this would be fantastic. It would be great if it could happen. Uh, ter uh, terrific, you know, let's hope this will happen, and so forth and so on. But I have my strong doubts based on, <laughs> based on history, sociology, uh, the study of human nature, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that this is going to happen, or that it ever has happened. It really has never happened. I, I admit, I'm, I will admit that once in a while, some heroic type pops up who does this, you know, some individual person. I, I think Bob Lafay, for example, converted some colonel. I think this is what happened. I, the, the lineaments of it, I think, are true. He converted a guy who was an army colonel who was just up for his pension in a couple of years, and he realized what he was doing was immoral, and he quit. He went back to private life. And this is fantastic and heroic and uh, magnificent. But, uh, but it's, again, it's only an individual case, and I doubt very strongly whether this is, can happen on a mass scale. So if this is not going to happen, if, uh, if Nixon, uh, Rockefeller, etc., etc., are not going to read our stuff and quit, then we have a problem of how to get them to quit, or how to get this thing either to abolish the state or to eliminate it, or whittle it down, uh, or whatever. <clears throat> and then, in other words, we have the problem of confronting power and how to do it, and uh, and what to do about it. <clears throat> um, and if we if we then if we try to confront power in some way or another and try to whittle down the state or abolish it, then then we have the problem of alliances. In other words, then we have the problem of dealing with non-purists in, in one way or the other, of relating to non-purists. And, uh, and as soon as we have the, as we have the problem of relating to non-purists, then we have the problem of alliances. Well, I must, I just want to also say there is another strategy, and that's retreatism, which is, was discussed yesterday, uh, going off to a platform in the Pacific or Atlantic or whatever. I don't want to really knock these people, it's just that I'm not really interested in living on some damn platform. <laughs> and I don't think 200 million Americans are interested in living on a platform either. <laughs> if they were, they'd be in trouble. So uh, I, I just disregard this as a strategic, as a viable strategic alternative. Uh, so we come then to a question of relating to other people, relating to, relating to non-purists. And as soon as you, the question of relating to non-purists comes up, then you have the question of, uh, of alliances. And there, there we have a, a problem. Because then we have the problem, who do we ally with, uh, on what terms, for what purposes, and so forth and so on. Now, my view is that uh, any kind of rational strategy involves picking priorities. In other words, picking areas or picking uh, uh, important political questions on which you know, which involve your top priorities, most important things, and ally with people who agree with you on that particular question. Uh, for example, supposing, just pick, pick a hypothetical case, supposing a fanatical movement arose in this country, a uh, powerful fanatical movement dedicated to exterminating all redheads. They, they came to the conclusion that redheads are evil, they're, they're tools of the devil, <laughs> so forth and so on. Uh, what do we do about it? Well, then it seems to me, if this were, you know, this was a commanding issue, then libertarians would get hep on this issue. They would drop the, I wouldn't say drop, they would uh, put on the back burner, in quotes, uh, the problems of, of uh, perception and conception, and, and you know begin to uh, 
discuss, you know, they begin to defend the redheads against extermination. Uh, <laughs> they, <laughs> they form a redheaded defense league. They would join. <laughs> They would join a red-headed defense league. And the point I'm trying to make is they would join a red-headed defense league even though many, if not most, of these redheads were not completely pure on every topic. They, didn't know, they might not know a damn thing about free will or perception. Uh, but they're, they're in trouble. They're in the process of perhaps being exterminated. And so we would join with them, I hope, we would join with them in trying to uh, combat this extermination. And so this is the point I'm trying to make. This is why... The problem of alliances come up, and this is why alliances sometimes shift. Because uh, if, uh, if, uh, if then you know, if then the anti-redhead movement phases out in a few years and begins to, and disappears more or less, then we sort of drop the redheaded defense league. We don't spend the rest of our life worrying about uh, discrimination against redheads in Keokuk, and you know, shift to other high-priority problems. <laughs> and uh, but see, this this one of the problems relating to the real world is that problems. Uh, often change, and if problems change in the real world, then our, our alliances and the pattern of our alliances also have to change with them. Uh, there's nothing inconsistent about this. What, what, what you're doing is you're, you're, you're taking your theory and relating it to the historical, current, contemporary context and figuring out what is your important priorities in the current, in the current situation and then uh, dealing with it. So, uh, in, in, uh, in my my personal view of the, situ of the current uh, situation and the, way that, and the situation of the last 10, 15, 20 years, as a matter of fact, is, as far as I'm concerned, the highest political ideological priority <coughs> for alliances, uh, the highest current problem is war and militarism. Now, this, this, uh, if you have this view, <coughs> if you believe that the single greatest threat to liberty is and uh, really always has been war and militarism, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, when I first started becoming a libertarian, one of the things we used to discuss a lot in our, our tiny little group was uh, why did the English Liberal Party collapse? I mean, how come the you know, English liberalism was essentially laissez-faire in the 19th century, and how come by the you know by World War One or later it had become a so socialist group? And one of the big reason that I discovered uh, was it was war, uh, war and imperialism. In other words, foreign policy, because what happened was that the most of the the mainstream of uh, English libertarians, uh, Cobden and Bright and these people, were isolationists, in quote. In other words, they were dedicated, opposed to any kind of foreign adventure of Great Britain, any kind of imperialism, any kind of war, any kind of intervention, any place. Because they believe, and I believe with them, that foreign intervention is, a, is, the, is the analog abroad of domestic intervention at home. In other words, if you want to limit the state, if you've got the state to begin with, if you're stuck with the state, you try to limit it as much as possible. And the limit, the, the foreign analog of domestic limit, is not pushing around other people outside your borders. In other words, not having, not not using the political arm to incur, uh, invade, incur upon, dictate to foreign people. So, uh, and this was the Cobden Bright position. But what happened was a, a good chunk of the Liberal Party didn't did, did not go along with this. They were patriots. They were English patriots and and so forth. As, well, as, as a result of this, they got embroiled in every English war and every English imperial venture. And this was a largely brought about the destruction of English 19th century laissez-faire liberalism. Because war and laissez-faire are really incompatible. And once you start with war, you've got uh, the budgets inexorably go up, for example. Taxes go up. Inflation comes in. Uh, plus a lot of controls, regulations, distortions of production, and so forth. Uh, and plus the whole spirit begins to change. The whole spirit changes from individual, uh, individualism to uh, glorification of the nation state, which, which goes along with it. And World War I put the kibosh to liberalism altogether. That was, that was, the, that was the final upshot, the final the finish. And in, in American history, it's a very similar process. The big, uh, the big advances, the big uh, leaps towards statism in the United States have, have always accompanied war. Uh, the Civil War was the first really big one. Uh, and uh, the Spanish-American War is another, is another chunk. And then World War I was an enormous one. And World War II, again, put the finish, more or less, to, the, to any kind of free market or free society. And uh, so what you have then, uh, 
with uh, and again the psychology which which comes in with war and and uh, so-called national defense is that uh, everybody's supposed to rally around the state. Well, the state's saying, uh, too, we don't like the, the fact that there's price controls or something like that. But we all have to rally around the state because the state is in danger. Um, and uh, this is supposed to, for libertarians, it's supposed to be a powerful argument to rally around. <laughs> in the first place, the state is almost never in danger, at least the American state has almost never been in danger. Uh, and second of all, uh, if they were, it's difficult for me to figure out why libertarians should rally around <laughs> to save it. <laughs> uh, the Civil War, for example, was used by the um, uh, Republican Party, which, which was almost a one-party state at that time in Congress, uh, to impose the draft for, for the almost the first time, impose the draft, the income tax for the first time, High tariffs, uh, huge subsidies to railroads, uh, excise tax, high excise taxes on things like liquor and tobacco, which of course remain and increase to the present day, and the end of free banking and the virtual end of the gold standard for, more, for a long time. Uh, so the Civil War is an enormous impetus to uh, the first big enormous impetus to statism in the, in the United States. World War One, which has not been studied very much in mean, the domestic front, I've done some studies of it. And World War I is a, was a fantastic example of collectivism in action. As a matter of fact, it was known at the time as war collectivism. And it was the tr not only the, the model and the inspiration, but the training ground for every for everything after that, including the New Deal and the World War II. As, as a matter of fact, the same people were running it, not only the, not only the same sort of agencies, but, that, but the same actual uh, personnel. Uh, in the present uh, setup, in the present America, it seems to me that, again, the Cold War and, Viet and the Vietnam War is just a uh, current example of it, is, is the single most important threat uh, to liberty. Uh, it's, it's brought about, of course, the draft, <coughs> um, militarism in general, uh, a military uh, attitude in this country, which, which leads to, to a widespread wiretapping, snooping, surveillance, and so forth and so on. Uh, a military-industrial complex which distorts and poses an enormous distortion on, on industrial machines so that an uh, enormous amount of industrial energy and resources go into uh, uh, un not only unproductive but anti-productive uh, resources, plus the scientific personnel which gets sucked up into, into war uh, research instead of uh, real, genuine scientific research on behalf of consumers. And, uh, of course, general destruction, destruction of millions of people in Vietnam, for example, plus an uh, uh, enormous number of American lives as well. So, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, just a, as a sort of a footnote of my Friedman talk yesterday, when, uh, when Milton Friedman's Capitalism and Freedom was published, it was reviewed by Kenneth Boulding in the Journal of Political Economy, and Boulding was the sort of a had been one of the Chicago, he's not a Chicago white, but he was, he was at Chicago at the same time Friedman was, and he was quite friendly to the free market in some ways. And he said, well, he's very interested, and he, he's sort of convinced by the book, except he says there's one glaring problem, why is Milton so soft on the Pentagon? <laughs> and I think that was a very astute comment. Uh, and of course, along with this comes uh, uh, high taxes, uh, inflation, high government spending, etc. Uh, and uh, as well as this, of course, looming around is the possibility of, of total nuclear annihilation, which is always, uh, which uh, at the very least is uh, not exactly a libertarian <laughs> position. <laughs> uh, uh, if, you, if, you, if you slaughter the whole world, it's, it's, uh, I, would, I would assume incompatible with liberty. I would like to see the nuclear threat uh, gotten rid of. And uh, continuing on, our present course aggravates and you know, makes the nuclear threat come much greater. So uh, I came to the conclusion quite a while ago, just as Cobden and Bright did in the England of their period, that the greatest single anti-libertarian thrust in the United States, the thing which was really wrecking us, was war, the Cold War, and, American, and the thrust for American empire. And so believing this, uh, it's not a question see, of looking around for allies, it's a question of accepting allies that are already there. Um, in other words, who is going to be allied with you is the real question. And, uh, and so, uh, the, uh, the, and then the, ally, the alliance, in quotes, uh, comes in naturally. Uh, it's, it's virtually automatic. In other words, if you look around, who are the people who are uh, opposed to the war machine, militarism, the draft, and so forth? It's largely the left, in quotes, in, in a very, very broad portmanteau term. That's true that much of the left, if not most of the left, uh, 
or would, would have been weak in World War II, for example. They might not have taken a, a, a sound position in World War II on this question. They might have been weak in the War of 1812, for all, for, all, for all I know. But the point is, we're faced with a current priority situation. Uh, World War II is happily behind us. And uh, in this situation, uh, it seems to me we take our allies as we find them, just as we would have in the Redhead Defense League. Uh, and this, is, this, I think, is, the, <clears throat> is stressing the, 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 the current uh, important priorities of our epoch. Uh, the, uh, and, this is, and this, in other words, so it's not a question of you know, desperately trying to seek people to ally yourself with. It's a question of finding you know, who, who are our allies right now, who are the people who are really battling the... Uh, American war machine, for example. Uh, and of course, I would be very happy to find either right-wingers, centrists, or just plain people uh, also involved in this struggle. I'm not dedicated to the left. Uh, it's simply a question of who is there, you know, who's, who's, who's there uh, opposing uh, the American militarism. Uh, okay, so I think uh, I've established, at least to my satisfaction, the uh, importance of uh, alliances, if, if you're not going to be sectarian and purely educationist. Uh, then the, uh, incidentally, as far as all those tactics that I mentioned, I don't see why any of these tactics are immoral a priori. I don't see why any of these tactics should be ruled out. Uh, so it becomes a question of which tactic is the most feasible at any given time. Uh, one, uh, if you come down to, down to alliances, uh, one problem with alliances, of course, there's a big problem. There are lots of problems with alliances, no question about that. But it seems to me we're stuck with them. One big problem with alliances is, is, is this. Uh, the sort of syndrome where you go something like this. One, we join allies. It's the first step. Okay, join allies in fighting the draft, let's say. Second step is we say, well, we shouldn't criticize these allies. They're important. We shouldn't attack them too much. Third step is... Uh, Third step is we sort of begin to lose the libertarian point. In other words, we begin to slip away from libertarianism altogether and become the allies. <laughs> See what I mean? In other words, uh, we start with the idea of converting, uh, of joining with them and possibly converting them, and we wind up ourselves being converted. <coughs> In other words, losing the point of the whole process and becoming either leftist or rightist or whatever, whatever group we're allied with at the time. Uh, and then lose the whole libertarian thrust that brought us into the alliance to begin with. <coughs> now, uh, so the question is, how can this be combated? It seems to me a very important thing to combat. Um, one way of combating is to always keep to the principle of a so-called critical alliance as against the uncritical alliance. The theory of the critical alliance is that you're constantly, first of all, you keep constantly push your own position at all times. Uh, you don't say, well, the Allies won't like us, we can't save this, because that's the first road on a slippery slope down to, uh, down to the abyss. So you constantly push your own position, you constantly attack the Allies also. Constantly say, these are crazy on this point, and they're ridiculous on this, and they're statist on that, and so forth and so on. Uh, uh, and constantly you know, push, you know, attack their errors. Uh, if we don't do that, if we don't attack their errors, and we, of course we won't be, we will fail to convert them at all, and also uh, we ourselves will become converted, because the, our own adherence to our own position will begin to slip away. Uh, as a matter of fact, it used to be when I was uh, first joined the movement a long time ago. There was, uh, there was, uh, of course, our allies were then the conservatives, and, uh, and the position was we should infiltrate them. There was this famous theory of infiltration. We sort of go there and we infiltrate, and we keep quiet and gradually win them over. And in almost every case, we were the guys being infiltrated. In other words, <laughs> uh, we were the people being won over <coughs> uh, by that kind of, uh, that kind of tactic. So uh, if we have to have allies, which I think we do, we, also, we, should also, uh, we have to also be tough with them in, in this sense. Um, the second thing, which I think is indispensable in this kind of uh, preventing defections to, to allies, is to build up our own uh, libertarian movement as an independent movement. Uh, which we're doing right now, of course, in the, in the process of being here. Uh, this seems to me to be our own key base. This is the base from which we go out, you know, being, you know, strengthening ourselves with our, our own education, our own literature, our own conferences, and so forth and so on. This is the base from which we go out to make out alliances and uh, work with people in the outside world. Um, I, call, I call this building up the cadre, the term which uh, uh, many people don't like. As a matter of fact, at this conference, I mentioned a few weeks ago, I was talking about the importance of building cadre, and 
one of the guys there said, I don't like this term cadre. I said, well, I'm, I'm sorry if you don't, you don't like it, you're in it, <laughs> whether you like it or not. Uh, and the cadre meaning people who were libertarians, or dedicated libertarians, who were uh, the, uh, purists, or whatever you want to call them, uh, and uh, who understand it and are trying to educate both themselves and other people in it. The, uh, and obviously, the, the stronger the cadre becomes, the stronger uh, uh, organizations like so, for example, become, the less chance there is of defection, the more chance there is of getting uh, dedicated uh, libertarians will continue as libertarians. <clears throat> uh, and incidentally, one of the, uh, the classic um, uh, goals of working with allies is a twofold goal, uh, which you try in working with an ally. One is you work for the, you both work for the common your, your common goal, say abolition of the draft, and the second thing is you try to recruit allies into your allies into your position or toe at least you know more closely to your position than they, than they were before, thus killing two birds with one stone, so to speak. Uh, at the present time, as uh, I think all of you undoubtedly know, uh, the libertarian movement has uh, for, has uh, very happily come going to a, some kind of takeoff stage of development. Uh, we've gotten a fantastic amount of publicity uh, in the media. The media has finally discovered libertarianism, sort of the big thing. And uh, it, might, it might well be a fad, uh, or partially a fad, or whatever. Uh, on the other hand, I think there are certain basic reasons why we might, we might be the big coming thing. As a matter of fact, I was just talking to uh, uh, a woman professor who's uh, editing a book on uh, left and right ideologies <coughs> for a textbook. Uh, paperback textbook. She has a lot of libertarian articles in there. And she said she's betting on the, the libertarian movement becoming very big on the campus in the next year or two. I said, I hope she's right. <laughs> and uh, I think this is uh, a lot of people, and certainly I know that a lot of major publishers are coming out with a lot of books, libertarian books, next season, next winter. Uh, that too should, you know, should advance the movement both internally and, and externally. So, uh, I think there are basic, some basic reasons for this. One is that liberalism is obviously dead, I mean intellectually, dead from the neck up. Uh, it's had it. <laughs> uh, I don't think, I don't think, there's a lot of liberals left, but they, they, they realize that something drastically wrong has happened. I mean, they've run the country for the last 30 years, and there's something, something wrong with it. Something's, there's a basic flaw there. Uh, liberals, I mean, uh, Lyndon Johnson was a distinguished liberal, and they, uh, everybody had to admit it. He was a, he called Franklin Roosevelt Big Daddy, or whatever the, uh, <laughs> and uh, his policies were Rooseveltian policies, from, from domestic and foreign, and they didn't like it. Uh, Richard Nixon is a liberal. He called himself a Keynesian the other day. He is, no question about it. So they're stuck with Nixon, too, and uh, they don't like that either. <laughs> In other words, they're stuck with a, with, a, with a Vietnam War, which is draining our substance. They're, they're stuck with a global foreign policy, global intervention. They're stuck with a big government at home, an enormous bureaucracy, uh, urban policies which don't work, and uh, rural policies which don't work, and everything. They're stuck with a, uh, with a generally collapsing system. And uh, they realize that liberalism is really responsible, and they don't know what, to, what in blazes to do about it. So who do they turn to, these liberals who are disaffected? Well, they can't turn to conservatism because they can't really worship uh, the crown of St. Stephen. <laughs> uh, incidentally, uh, I, I just as, a, as an aside, it's kind of cheeky for um, uh, Buckley to consider us kooks because uh, I'm, I'm, when I used to be in the conservative uh, ambit, uh, many of the cocktail party, many of the evening would pass by by arguing about should we worship the crown of St. Stephen or the crown of St. Wenceslas or the crown of St. Uh, whoever. So, uh, which is not, not really very relevant to our epoch, even less relevant than lighthouses. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so conservatism is really out, and also conservatism, of course, conservatives are the main and the main spearhead for the war machine. I mean, they're into every war anywhere: bomb Moscow, bomb Hanoi, bomb bomb Peking. It doesn't make any difference. Whatever war there is, they're in it. So they can't. So liberals can't turn to conservatism. They can't turn to well, who else? They can't turn to the, to the, the far left or the extreme left because they're either in hiding or uh, uh, or Stalinist or, or you know crazy. So uh, the, so uh, they're, they're, who's who's left but us? I mean, we're the only people left <laughs> to present a new idea uh, for the only political ideology that remains. Um, so I think uh, there's an enormous amount of interest, uh, and I think an enormous an enormous amount of people 
out there will be turning our direction. So we have a sense of an historic opportunity to acquire to, uh, for real, you know, real uh, accelerated growth. Uh, given this historic opportunity, it seems to me we have a moral obligation not to blow it, <laughs> uh, if we can help it. Um, not to scare off potential recruits with, uh, with uh, uh, emotionally satisfying but unnecessary rhetoric, for example. Uh, not to turn on our heel because someone is not fully hep on the theory of perception. Uh, not to call for blowing up the entire country. Uh, these sort of things are not going to exactly win, win friends and influence, <laughs> influence people. Uh, and so, uh, hoping that we do this, and with the help of a passion for justice, married to rationality and good sense, uh, we possibly can make it long last a real and significant dent in American life. And maybe we can even win. Maybe we can attain freedom in our time. Let us hope so. Thank you.